phase of the programme, uh, which was originally launched as the Northern Ireland Supper Beef Programme in, 20, in 2011, uh, run for two three-year phases, and a new programme started earlier this year and renamed as the Better Farm Beef Challenge NI. We, so we have got 10 farmers on the programme, all of whom work with sucklers, suckler cows. Some are selling cattle to stores, some are finishing their calves through the beef. Uh, we have at least one farmer in each county, uh, a mix of land types, enterprise sizes, systems of production, but with one clear objective on all those farms, and that is to make them, each one of them as profitable as possible, as possible. So to achieve that, the focus is very much on following best practice, whether it's uh, good grassland management, making good quality silage, uh, feeding, cow breeding, calving at two years, following defined animal health plans. Uh, we will develop a number of those uh, issues as we go forward this evening. We have three partners in the programme, ourselves in the Farmers Journal, uh, CAFRI and ABP Food Group. And can acknowledge the, the contribution that, that, that they make. Uh, CAFRI provide a lot of the day-to-day -day management advice, uh, when the programme just would not be possible without the financial contribution made, made by ABP. You can follow what's happening on each of the farms each week in the Farmers' Journal. Uh, for those of you who read the paper, there's also the code in the back of the Irish Country Living. If you plug that into your, into your computer or phone, it will give you access to all of our content online. That includes further information and videos on each of the farms. So the running order this evening, I will hand over to my colleague, Kieran, Kieran Mealy, who will look at trends in beef markets and prospects for prices this winter. Following that, Dr. Norman Weatherup from Caffrey will discuss feeding options. I will then hand on to Francis, who along with, the program, with one of our programme farmers, uh, Mark Lewis from Portadown, and Moreto Grady from John Lauder Vets. Uh, they will together talk through in more detail day-to-day -day management on the farms. Mark has also kindly agreed to bring in some stock this evening to aid the discussion. So, uh, look, we, we are streaming the event on, uh, on, on Facebook tonight, so, so welcome to all those guys who are watching us online. Um, also, the, the guys who are sitting in the canteen, unfortunately they're not, they're not here, but uh, hopefully, they're, hopefully they'll, they'll still be able to, to see what's going on uh, from, 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 the mark, from the ring here over into the canteen. So, I'll hand over at this point to, to Kieran Mealy. Thank you. Okay, thanks, David. Um, folks, there's a screen behind me here. If you want to maybe drift around, you, you maybe see better, but it's up to yourself. But look, at, I am very quickly just going to go through a few things. Basically, overview of the cattle industry, beef sector, where we are, where we've come from. I'll quickly go through the sucker cow numbers, go through the, the, the stats on the cattle kill, few market prices, how they've progressed over the years, a few challenges for the sector going forward. And profitability, you know, what is profitable within suckers? What is possible there that we can do? I suppose, look at, just setting the scene for over the last 15 years, I've picked out three years and specifically, obviously this year, 2012 and 02, and the thing they all had in common was they were extremely challenging years in terms of a weller. They had wet summers, wet autumn times, delayed harvest, shortage of silage, and one thing and another. And I suppose it's probably no surprise to you to see that the trend in cows has gone down over that period of time. We've gone from 307,000 cows to just over 20, two, or 267,000 this year past. Obviously, going back 15 years ago, you had the suckler cow premium uh, back in those days. So, you know, there was no value in culling cows necessarily, whereas now, cull cow price, the cull cow is actually worth something. So unproductive cows, you know, should we actually have them standing there on the, on the farm. In terms of cow, uh, actual farms on the ground, Back in 02, we had about 15,900 farms, about 15 and a half, just slightly over it in 2012, and we're down now to about 14,756. That's the last number of suckler herds. Average herd size hasn't really increased. You know, 19, 18 cows, that's where we've been, and we'll probably consistently be in around that over the next few years as well. Obviously, just stuck in there for the point of reason being, I'll come to it later on in terms of competition from dairy bred beef. As suckler cow numbers have gone down, the size of our dairy herd has expanded. Not necessarily any more dairy farmers, there's actually less. They've come from, they're down now to about just over 3,500 dairy farms in the country. But obviously the size of the herds have got much bigger. But at the point to make is in the last line there as well. Back in 02, when we had our subsidies and our cows and there was a lot of inefficiency in the system, between our dairy cows and our sucker cows, we were producing about 1.68 million cattle across the year. That's all cattle standing on the ground. This current year, obviously a lot less cows. We're sitting at 1.66 million cattle. So it just shows you the level of inefficiency, as I said, when you had no, when you had no cull market for your cows. And obviously, if our, if, our, if our breeding product, if the raw material starts to decrease in the suckler cows, that obviously is a knock-on knock effect in terms of the annual cattle kill. Going back from 02 up to 2017, we were starting off about 
410,000 cattle slaughtered every year in Northern Ireland. Peaked at about 440 in around 2004 time. This one, the last year of the, the old punching schemes. And it's been a general steady decline, bar one year in around 2010. We've been inclined, and this year we're probably looking at about 320,000 cattle there, thereabouts to kill across the year. So that's the year to date, so we're well down. Obviously, then when the export markets opened up in 06, we were allowed to put cull cows back into the food chain, we started to see the cull cow numbers started to increase coming onto the market. Look at what are the big issues facing the farmers. You know, we talk about profit. What is profit? Oh, lots of ways and lots of different issues for us. I suppose, look at, you take the year that's in it, the weather has been the determining factor. It has been the biggest hindrance, regardless of where you are in the country. A lot of delayed harvest, a lot of lads, lads haven't got a second cut finished up yet, getting the slurry out, all the challenges that that brings, grazing and what have you. The costs of the inputs. We'll always say the farming has got a lot dearer, and we'll come on to that in a wee minute again, but yes, yeah, there's no doubt, a lot of inputs have risen over time. Grazing, the silage challenge. Look at, uh, same again, Weller. Are we making best use of grass? What's our stocking rates? Our stocking rates haven't really changed that much across the country. In terms of silage quality, you look back over the last 20, 25 years, there hasn't been that much of an increase in terms of silage quality, energy, protein, digestibilities. And the beef price, a lot of you probably hang the hat on that the price is everything. The price is only part of the jigsaw. It's the one, one part of the jigsaw. There's three P's in profit. You have to have the price, no doubt about it, but you have to have the performance. Your cattle have to be performing and doing that every year, and you have to have their production. All cows have to be contributing to the, su to the system. Animal health, look at, we're in an area here that gets hit a lot with TB. It decimates herds, you're trying to put in a breeding program, and you get wiped out, and you have to start again. Very, very frustrating to try and do those type of things. And land availability, and the suckler side of things, we all know the challenge, fragmented land, or con acre land, you start to improve it, build up the P's and K's, or you go to fence it, and then somebody comes on and out bids you, takes the land off you, very soul destroying. Big, big issue for us going forward. Coming back to the cost of inputs, as I say, look at, there's no doubt about it, it has got dearer to farm in certain ways, but has it actually got any dearer than we were a couple of years ago? I put up a few, few costs here, a few prices of two of the key inputs. Meal, taking a 16% ration, and these figures are up on the department website, you can go through the statistics, and check through, and I've on three back issues of the Farmer's Journal just to sort of verify my own interest. Back in 02, you were looking at about 150 pound, probably 155, maybe 160 times a year for a beef ration. In 2012, if you cast your mind back, the real, real heavy wet summer or wet we had in the spring of 2013 with the fodder crisis, beef ration up here was talking about 230. In the south, it was over 300 euro a tonne. This incoming year, 205, 210, some boys probably get a 200 pound a ton. That's the cost. So a, a ration is actually cheaper than it was in a few years ago, partly because of the price of oil. Uh, but also another factor is, if you remember back a few years ago, China was a major buying power within farming. They're buying a lot of fertilizer. They're buying up a lot of steel. As I say, when the price of oil, it feeds related to the price of oil. All those factors were all contributing towards it. Fertilizer then, back in 02, nitrogen was costing about 130 pounds, between a ton, 135 and around peak time. Back in 2012, a tonne of can was about 250 a tonne. This year, probably across the spring, it risen fell, yes, but it probably averaged out about 220. It fell as low as 170 in August time, and has been rising steadily since. Diesel, just to put that into context, the price of diesel back in 2012 was just over 70 pence, pushing towards 80 pence for red, red diesel. It's what, 50 odd pence at the minute. So like, the point I'm trying to make is, certainly it has got dear to farm. But our cost of inputs, believe it or not, are slightly lower than we were a few years ago. But our peak price has risen up. So the challenge is, or the question is, where are we losing out? Is it inside the farm gate that we're not, not pushing the system to its maximum efficiency? There's roughly a chart tracking beef price across those 15 years. Back in 02, when the subsidies were going, you're looking at about 155, 160 a cow, or a kilo for beef, for steers and heifers. Rising up to this year, we're sort of looking at about 355 to 360 of an average across, across the year. That's obviously the horse meat one there in the spring of 13 that drove that, that spike. And there's the price of cows going across the years as well as starting to raise coming forward. So cull cows worth an awful lot at the minute. None of these are in the market here regularly or in the other marts. You'll see the price of them, the cull cows making 160 up to 170 at the top end of the market. There's value there to be had on them. So if they're not producing 
and you'll hear Mark and Francis going through a system of what cows are actually doing in terms of weaning efficiency, should we be cashing them in? Those of you that deal through the mart, not necessarily finishing cattle, what's been happening here? Very, very quickly, look. That's the average price of mart or heifers across the last seven, eight years, from 2009 up to the present day, from our mart watch data in the Farmer's Journal. There's not an awful lot of variation within the three weight bands, 300 to 400, 400 to 500, and 500 kilos plus. There's the beef price, put in context across those years. Beef price roughly in 2009, mid-250 to 260, up to the present level. Finishing cattle is the blue one, the big heavy forward cattle. That has started to rise. That has increased roughly about 140 up to about 185, pushing 190 at the top end of it. So it has reflected through. And very simply, that's the trend in steers. That is reflected as well. So live weight per kilo, you're looking at 40 to 50p of an increase against a pound a kilo in beef price increase. So challenges for the sector. Look, at you all know the model that we work in. There's no certainty of price. You know, we work, we're working blind. You go out to buy the cattle, you're buying your inputs. 100 days away, you can be 200 days away from finishing an animal. What, what is your end price? You have to try and work in within your limits of what you're trying to do. But I suppose, look, the other thing as well is, well, you'd like to have a beef price increase. And generally, there is one comes at Christmas. It hasn't materialized yet. And we're into the mid-November mid now. You have to bear in mind that we have cheaper competition from poultry and pork. So how far can beef actually go before it starts to see, the retail sales start to drop? At the minute, manufacturing beef is very strong. That's keeping a, a floor in the trade. The steak cuts, the prime cuts are actually under pressure at the minute, which is why there probably hasn't been the usual rise at this time of year. Carcass weight. I put this in because some of you will probably think, sure, carcass weight only applies when there's, plenty, when there's a shortage of cattle. It doesn't apply when you have more cattle on coming onto the market. But the big thing is, within our market, the supermarket, the retailers, the multiple retailers as our best customer. It's our number one customer. 63% of the steers we're putting out are in the spec for that, mar that market. 75% of our heifers. And if it materializes in the situation this time next year, or in the spring of next year, there's more cattle coming on the market. It's the ones that the factories know that are in spec and come in regularly that generally get the priority. You know yourself, if you've been killing cattle last month, there was delays of plants trying to get them booked in because of, there was a flush of cattle coming off grass. But the inspect cattle tend to get the priority in terms of the kill. So bear that in mind. That's how you add value to your animals. Brexit, look at we're, we're not getting into it. You could stand here for two hours to talk on it. But the big issue for us is the threat of imports. Um, we're a high cost production system. We can't argue with that. There are a lot of countries out there that they want to do trade deals with in terms of financial services and pharmaceutical services. They can produce beef a hell of a lot cheaper than we can. So we have to be mindful of that. that we have to protect the UK market first and foremost. That's the first trade part of the trade deal is protect the home market because that is our, our, our bread and butter in terms of beef price. In terms of exports, I said if we're a high cost system, it limit, limits the number of markets we can probably sell into at a profitable price. So that is something that we have to bear in mind as well. Ideally, yes, we can add value in certain markets for four quarters and awful and what have you. And the dairy bed brief side of things, there's no doubt about it, there's more than coming online. You'll probably start to see it already. And the specialist premiums that are available for some of the breeds, are they going to be there in the future? They're possibly under pressure as it is within the UK. Or looking at our beef price, you've probably seen it. Hasn't really changed in the last two months. It's been a fairly steady year this year from the turn of the year. But where is Northern Ireland as, as a beef producing region within Europe? Look at Europe as the big paying, uh, big paying beef producing region. Sweden has the top price. 413 pence, 414 pence a kilo on an R3 heifer right across the year. Italy next, Greece, about 381 pence. Britain, which is basically driven by the Scottish price more so than the English price, almost 372 pence. Northern Ireland's average just short of 360 a pence right across the year. We had a good spring. We come back a bit late August to September time, but that's where it has been, about 360 across the year. So we're about the fifth highest paying price within the EU region. There's the EU average at the bottom, 341 pence a kilo. So look at, as I said, a steady market, that's what it's been, and that's probably going to be the outlook for this winter. Some of you might be saying, well, I cattle go in the next month, that's no good to me. But you have to look at it and realistically, a steady market does everybody favours. We know when prices go up, they have to come down. And vice versa, where if you have a steady supply of cattle, cattle come on the market as processors can handle it. And in the grand scheme of things, it does everybody a favour. Everybody gets a turn out of it. Whereas when we have peaks and trucks, we have losers, we have winners. And that's, 
that's the reality of our production. In terms of numbers going forward, this year we'll probably finish up with about 336,000 cattle. These are our cattle slaughtered. That's prime cattle. This is off the LMC forecast. The final quarter of this year, so October, November, December, you're looking at almost 93,000 cattle. So about 3,000 more than this time last year. We did about 5,000 more in the third quarter of the year. But going into the spring of next year, you're looking at about 87,000 cattle as opposed to 85. So an extra couple of, hundred th couple of thousand, 81,000 in the second quarter of the year. That'll all come from dairy bred beef and the vast majority of things because the tendency has been to switch a bit more towards bulls in recent years within, within the sucker herd. In the grand scheme of things, 349,000, probably 350,000 cattle will be killed next year. So we'll be up about 14, 15,000 head. Is it possible to make beef with all those extra numbers? We believe yes, it is. And Francis and Mark will go through the systems and stuff. But just going across the farms in the Northern Ireland Sucker Beef Program, from 2010 up to 16, average farm size about 67 hectares up to 69. So fairly representative across Northern Ireland. Herd size, 56, it increased to 68. Output went from 700 pound a cow up to over 1,000 pound a cow. So basically a 50% increase from the start of the program. Variable costs, more importantly, stayed the same. That's our feed, our fertilizer, our veterinary fees. Stayed fairly consistency, even though we're having more cattle on farm. Gross margin per cow doubled from 344 up to 68.6. And our gross margin per hectare, that's every hectare of land farmed. Something similar, it actually increased by 200%, 360 up to 920. So there's massive prog progress can be made within the farm. It's just are you prepared to start and make the changes? And that's just me finishing off here. Look at this red line. That's the farms that are in the phase one. That's the rate of progress they've been in terms of profitability. The yellow one's the top 25%. There's benchmarking. Hopefully you can through your BDG groups. You're doing a bit of benchmarking. You know what you're aware of. But the important point is year to year, these points here, the gap has, has been widening from the top 25 to the farms in the program. The phase two farmers, well, they started off fairly below average, shot up above it. They're closing in on the top 25, and they actually will probably be in there probably this income year if you do their sums again. I'm going to pass on the, I've, I, I, I've said my piece, so I'm going to pass over to Norman Weller here from Caffrey, and he's going to go through a bit on feeding options and what have you for the winter time. Yes, hello? Okay. <clears throat> Can I hear some? Hmm? Okay, folks, we're, we're wired up and on the air. <clears throat> it's very, very echoey, that, but... Okay, <clears throat> I know this is a, a beef night, but uh, I'll just give a plug for a conference coming up in Greenmount at the end of the month, Efficient Lamb Production, uh, on Wednesday the 29th. It's an all-day conference. Um, it costs £20, and you need to book in at the UFU website. Uh, it's first come, first serve. Spaces are filling up, so if you have any interest in sheep, um, get yourself booked on as quickly as possible. I also want to give another plug to Farm Family Key Skills. Uh, there's a number of courses available across the province. Uh, you can log in at the Caffrey website. Uh, if it means anything to you, it's on Facebook uh, today as well, or you can email ktadmin 
So that's the, that's the commercials over. Uh, we'll get into the bones of the presentation now. So it's, as most of you know, it was a, a pretty good grass growing summer for a while. Uh, and then the growth was good, but utilization was bad. And then I think every month from July, we've had at least 130% of the, <clears throat> the long-term average rainfall. So there, there was a lot of silage that wasn't harvested. There was a lot of grass that wasn't eaten. There was a lot of cattle put in the house early. Um, so the, there's a big issue, is there going to be enough forage uh, to, to take us right through the winter? And you know, if you think of a budget going from today until the, the end of April, and hopefully it's an earlier spring than that, but it's about 170 days uh, from now until the end of April, and it's coming up on 80 days until we can spread slurry again. So that, those are two very important uh, factors to take into account. So the first thing is doing a fodder budget to make sure that you've got enough. And you can either do a paper version, and we've got some uh, outside on the, the, the table as you come in there, hopefully. On one side, it's metric measurements, and the other side, it's imperial, so it, it caters for all ages. And you can do it online on the DERA website. So if you go into the DERA website right near the front page, you, you'll see a section that deals with all the material that we have going out about fodder this winter. So in this case, we've got an example uh, of a, a man with a, a silage clamp. And if you look at the dimensions, uh, 87, we're doing it in feet, uh, so it's somebody to suit my age, 87 feet by 30 by 8, and a nice round number divided by 50 cubic feet, so you can do the sums easy at this time of the night, 21,000 cubic feet in round figures divided by 50, is just over 400 tons. So this man has got 400 tons of silage in the clamp, and he's also got a number of round bales, 120 round bales. We're saying 650 kilos here, and we've got a slide coming up shortly, just looking at some different weights of bales. So that's given him another almost 80 tons of silage in round bale form, so he's got a total of 495 tons. Now he's got a, a number of different types of stock on the farm, uh, 45 uh, spring calving cows that will be in for six months, uh, and then different numbers of young stock for six months, and then 250 ewes uh, in for a month and a half. So he needs a total of 581 tons of silage to take him through the winter. So from the previous slide, he's got a shortfall of 86 tons. So I'd say it, it's important not just to do the budget tomorrow uh, and do the sums, but I would say repeat it regularly and see whether you're on track and on budget over the winter and also do a reality check. I think that's important because I've seen students at times doing calculations and maybe sometimes there's a slip of the calculator and a figure not just right. Just run through it in your head to make sure that, that, it, that it does make sense. And if you think of the, the example before, the silo was, in, right, in round figures, uh, 90 feet long. So that's probably six bays. We've got six months. So is he going through one bay per month? So that's a simple way just to keep on track or mark the silo wall and see how far you're traveling, uh, just to make sure that you're, you don't get any big surprises near the end of the winter. So in terms of the, the ins and outs, you can see that we've got... Uh, different intakes for different types of cows, whether autumn or spring calving, different stages of young stock. Now obviously, there's quite a range, 350 kilos plus, so you need to make some adjustments. If, if your cattle are all 500 kilos, you'll need to up that a wee bit, and so on. And then also important to bear in mind that what goes in must come out, so that if we take a dairy cow producing 350 gallons of slurry per month, uh, down to the young stock, a calf at 50 gallons per month. So if you're thinking about uh, not just uh, silage availability, but slurry storage capacity, you need to make allowance for have you got enough to go in and enough to store the slurry as well. So if you're like the, the, the man in the, in the example, and you've got a shortfall, you can buy something. So you could just buy a bit more of the, the feed that you're normally buying, uh, and that'll cut down the fodder requirement. You could buy silage, hay, or straw if it's a, 
available. Availability is a big issue. Sometimes there's some parts of the country it's just not there to be bought, uh, no matter how much it costs. You could buy fodder <coughs> such as soya hulls, uh, and they're a pretty good example because they have a, a fairly similar analysis to good quality silage, so it can be just fed straight quite simply. There's other things might need to be adjusted or balanced. Moist feeds, um, distillers, grains, bread, some of those things, usually there's a long waiting list for them, and if you haven't been buying them before, it's unlikely that you're going to be on the list this winter. And there's a, a big issue, and we'll talk a bit more about that, about moist feeds, just about dry matter content. And <coughs> there's the, the old, uh, I suppose I can say this, that we're in Market Hill, the old County Antrim example, just feed a bit less and let the animals lose condition. The, but we, again, we've got some slides in that, we need to be careful with condition loss. This is quite a complicated looking slide. It's about relative feed values, and there's a, a relative feed value calculator uh, on the DERA website, which you can plug in some values. And all it simply does is take the price of barley as an energy source and the price of soya as a protein source. It does some calculations and comes up with a unit value uh, or a cost for a unit of protein and a unit of energy. And then it multiplies up these different contents for all the different feeds, and it works out how much is that feed worth based on its analysis relative to the price of barley and soya. So some of these feeds can be good enough quality in themselves, but they're just too expensive, and that's a case of buying gold too dear. Or if you can buy it for less than the, the program thinks it's worth, then it's good value. For example, maize gluten uh, for growing cattle, according to its analysis, is worth 199. The current, the most recent price we had was 170. So that that means it's good value. Um, other ones there, maize meal, especially in a high concentrate system, is worth 209. The last price we had was 185. So those are two examples of feeds that are pretty good value. Soya hulls. They're, it's, they're worth 173 at current prices. You can buy it at 178. So I'm saying it's about at its value, but at the same time, it's, as I said before, a very simple feed. You can add it along with the silage. No more adjustments needed to be done. So nice and simple. On the protein side of things, rapeseed meal is worth 264. The most recent price we had was 210, so good value. And maize distillers, dark grains, also good value at 188. Now, what th that table doesn't take into account is convenience. So, as I said, soya hull is nice and simple. Some of the other things, you need to mix something else with it uh, to balance it. The quality, it doesn't take into account. So, for example, cardboard, everything has a value. So, cardboard may look on paper as if it's good value, but if the stock won't eat it or they won't thrive on it, well, then it, it doesn't really matter. Or if you've got something with an awful lot of one particular mineral or not enough of another mineral, again, it doesn't take those uh, imbalances into account either. In terms of the, the, forage, the forage types, um, based on the analysis, it's saying hay is, is worth 118 pounds a ton. It's probably worth an awful lot more than, or costs an awful lot more than that. Straw at 76. In that, when, as, as it's being traded, probably costing about twice that. So if you're simply buying straw for its nutrient content, there's much cheaper ways to do it. If you're uh, buying straw just to keep a rumen functioning, well then a small amount is probably fair enough. On the silages, poor silage, 29 pound a ton, based on this analysis, up to 49 pounds a ton for excellent quality silage. Now, I'm not saying that that's what you should pay, or if you're selling it, that's what you should ask for. Simply based on its energy and protein and dry matter content, based on barley and soya, that's what the nutrients add up to. Now, there's a lot, an awful lot of small print in this one, not including weight, uh, weight estimation. 
I know in my example, I used a nice round figure of 50 uh, cubic feet per tonne. It depends a lot on the dry matter. There's different factors that you need to use. So if you're using the wrong factor, you could be out a bit in your estimation. You could quite easily lose 10% in waste over the top of the silo and around the shoulders. So the, the tonnage of a silo that you buy, by the time you get it down the animal's throat, uh, it may be a different tonnage altogether, and that obviously uh, changes the, the bottom line. It doesn't take haulage into account. For example, your barley soya mix, the price is uh, blown into a bin. If you have to drive somewhere, pick up these bales, bring them home again. Again, you could buy a bale and you find there's a hole around the back of it that you didn't see and there's a, a bit of waste on it. Getting rid of the plastic and the time that you spend uh, carting this silage about and feeding it out. So what looks like 49 or 50 pounds a tonne could end up an awful lot more expensive than that by the time you have everything accounted for. So this is a good one. Um, without a weigh bridge, one of the easiest ways to start a riot is to guess the weight of a suckler cow or guess the weight of a round bale. So in this case, we've got three bales. If you're just going to buy off the newspaper uh, or just by word of mouth, you can see bales, they're wrapped, they're in the corner of the field. Without an, an analysis, you don't know any more than that. So here's three different bales with three uh, very different dry matter contents. 16% in this one, 47 in bale 2, 32.2 in bale 3. And just to mix it up a wee bit, we've got quite different energy contents. So we've got 9.6, which is nothing very exciting, maybe okay for a dry spring calf and cow, uh, up to 11.4 which would be uh, better targeted toward a finishing animal. And again, in protein content from 13 and a half uh, down to nine. So quite a range. <clears throat> Let's look at the weight of the bale. 975 for bale one, so it's a, a very heavy bale. 540 for bale two, 685 for bale three. So again, quite a range of total weight. So even you're buying by the ton, there, there's going to be quite a difference. When you divide the weight, or multiply the weight of the bale and the dry matter content, and you get down to how much dry matter there actually is in the bale, again, there's quite a difference. So although bale 2 was our lightest overall at 540, in fact, there's the most dry matter in it. And bale one, even though it's the heaviest at 975, there's only 156 kilos of dry matter. So when you start multiplying through the dry matters, the energy and the protein, we get quite a range uh, in value per ton, from 27 pound a ton for bale one up to 79 pound a ton for bale two. And obviously it's the dry matter that's really driving that one. So in terms of the value of a bale, 27 pound for bale one. If you pay any more than that, you'd be cheaper just buying the nutrient as barley and soya. You could pay 42 pound for bale two and 38 for bale three. And I just did the, the calculation. Bale one, if you take the total weight of the bale, 975, and take off the dry matter, 156 kilos, if you paid £27 for this bale, for the privilege, you are taking home a very small amount of dry matter, a couple of kilos of plastic, and 819 kilos of water. What a bargain. Like water falls out of the sky, costs you nothing every day in this country without paying £27 for the privilege of getting it. Now, there's still some silage to be cut, and there's some that has been cut in recent times. Uh, what can we do with it? It's a, it'll have very low sugar content at this time of the year, so very poor fermentation. It'll be acidic and butyric. Uh, whenever you open it, everybody will know. You'll get the smell. Don't be stacking the bales. All that will deform. They'll, they'll fall into a sausage roll shape soon enough, uh, and that'll let air in. Feed them as soon as possible because they're most likely going to go off. 
they'll heat the, when they're opened, so feed them as, make sure when you do open one that you get through it as quickly as possible. People ask from time to time about adding molasses. Yes, it, it will increase intake. We've seen some studies from America where the initial intake of the animal goes up, all right, but over a 24-hour period, uh, there was very little in difference uh, in intake at all. And in terms of the nutrient content, what you get for your money's worth, it's a bit like BL1. You're, you're buying a fair amount of water, and for the nutrients in it, uh, it's overpriced. And the other thing to, to bear in mind, there could be a lot of soil content in it, uh, which could lead to digestive upsets uh, and also clostridial diseases. So make sure your, uh, your black leg uh, vaccinations and everything like that is up to date. We mentioned uh, moist feeds earlier on, and I, I have always tried to say, just be very careful about buying low dry matter feeds. Now, some people have almost had a row with me. Uh, am I trying to say that, that this stuff is bad or is poor quality? No, definitely not. But you need to be careful when you're buying something with a lot of water in it that you don't pay an, uh, too much for the water that, or that you end up buying gold too dear. Who does the analysis? I mean, in 15 or 17 years, there's some feeds that are sold regularly, and I have only ever seen one analysis ever quoted for it. And do you think that it has never changed in 17 years? Um, who did it? Was it the person selling it? Was it one particularly good batch just to get it analyzed to, to make it look good? So just be very careful who does the analysis. If you're uh, buying low dry matter feeds, that's somebody has had to cart a lot of water around the countryside. Whenever you get it, can you handle it? Have you got the facilities? Do you have to clean it? Do you have to do anything more with it? Do you have to mix it with something? Is it ready to feed right away? Um, does it keep? Have you got enough animals to go through it fast enough without it going off? Uh, can you store it? Will it change? Will it uh, deteriorate over time? So there's quite a number of things to, to take into account. Another thing that I've seen, you, you need to be very careful about the analysis that, that's coded and just exactly what basis uh, that you're buying it on. So if you think of, of this feed, if you imagine um, this is uh, a bucket and what we've managed to do is squeeze all the dry matter and all the nutrients down into the bottom of the bucket and then it's water just filled up to the top. So even you double the size of this bit, here's the nutrients, it, they don't change. That's the bit that's feeding the animal. That's the bit that's doing it any good. This is just giving it a drink, okay? So if you put this bucket into an oven uh, for 24 hours, 100 degrees, the water all disappears, and what you're left with now is no water and just the same amount of dry matter. On this, in this feed, the protein content is 3%. And over on this side, because the water is all gone, if you think it, you've gone for custard back to custard powder, so everything is more concentrated, now it's 12%. So if you think about it, this is your silage analysis, 12% on a dry matter basis, here's the silage as it's sitting in the clump, it's only 3% as fed. So you can see there's quite a difference between three and 12. So whenever you're buying something, make sure you know exactly what basis that it's being coated on. How expensive can it be? So let's say we take our, our dried barley, 174, with 14% moisture in it, 86% dry matter. The next one is 65% dry matter, so there's a bit more water in it. It's only worth 132 pounds a ton. And the one at the far end at 50% dry matter, it's only worth 101 pounds a ton. So you can see there's exactly the same amount of dry matter in each one, but we've just added different amount of water. So you've got more to haul about the country. You've got a, your, your bucket full looks bigger, but the same amount of nutrient, so you have to pay accordingly less. So that's one side of the equation. You could buy silage, you could buy feed, uh, buy fodder replacers. The other side is to sell something, reducing the, reducing the stock to reduce demand. So in order of the effect that that will have, 
uh, number one uh, as an empty cow, she's the one that's going to have the, the biggest intake. So if you're spring calving and you haven't PD'd, you should get that done right away, and any cows that's not in calf uh, should get down, go down the road to reduce your silage demand. The next one is maybe a cow that could be in calf, but she calves late every year. She's slipping. Her calf uh, is, is very poor quality. Uh, I know at our hill farm, uh, we always have, have some cows that are pushing 800 kilos, and yet their calf is only half the weight of another cow at 650 kilos. So she looks impressive, but she's looking after herself. She's not doing anything for the calf. That's a candidate for getting rid of. Strong stores, should they be fed on to finish or just sold? Uh, we'll come to that in a minute. Strong weanlings, um, although the, your silage saving effect is reducing all the time. Later born weanlings, and then use or store lambs. So a much more minimal effect with them. So suckler cow, PD and sell the dry ones. Uh, don't be sentimental. It's the best thing you'll ever do. Say goodbye. If the cow's still suckling, spring-born calves, take the calf off and restrict the cow uh, if you've got the facilities to do that. Again, that nearly always starts a riot. You know, what about the milk that this cow's given? Well, you know, think about it. A dairy cow peaking at, at uh, 45, 50 litres at peak milk yield at six weeks, coming down to eight, nine, ten months. How many litres is she given? Not that many. So if you think of the difference between a cow peaking at 50 litres versus one that's only peaking at 10, by the time she gets to six or seven months of age, it'll not take a very big jug to, to hold all the milk. So take the calf off and restrict the cow and put the feed into the calf instead. Review any cows not performing, especially anything with a poor temperament. Uh, you know, what's, what's a life worth? A cow that gives any trouble should be on the hit list. And mobilize body condition if possible. So again, the function of a suckler cow, she should be able to put on some condition cheaply at grass and afford to lose some condition uh, over the winter. Now that doesn't mean that you take her down to condition score a half uh, and you sh totally starve her. It has to be responsible to get her down into target condition. People think about uh, calving difficulty. And this is an American study. So again, the calf isn't likely to be that brutal in the first place. But taking a, a big number of cows, all AI to the same bull, and the two groups, a control group, and then another one where they uh, took two condition scores off the, the cow, it reduced calf birth weight by 12%. It had no effect on calving difficulty, the number of cows that had to be assisted, although again, in an American study, they wouldn't have been that lot, that big a difference, or that, that much intervention. Having the cows too thin did increase time to first heat by 11 days, and it reduced the percent in calf at the autumn PD from 79% down to 47%. Now, that would be a very short period of... A Need to put another 50p in the meter. Okay, there we go. So you need to think very carefully about bull selection. Yes, you can, you can feed difficulty into a cow by having her too fat. I understand that. But at the same time, you can't really starve in Cavanese. There's a lot in bull selection. In terms of finishing forward stores, should we sell now? If you go for intensive feeding, that'll be quite expensive. Not as bad as 2012, as Kieran has been saying. Um, and you should target animals with, that'll do it inside 100 days of feeding. So steers about 500 kilos plus and heifers over 450 kilos uh, would be the ideal candidates for that. Others should be stored and grass finished next year. So if we de decide to keep on this 400 kilo store uh, and sell them again in the springtime uh, versus selling now, the assumptions that I've got is that we're going to keep this store gaining half a kilo a day for five months, sell them in the springtime. Average silage is going to cost us £35 a tonne. Poor silage, £30 a tonne. And we're buying feed or concentrate at £200 a tonne. 
So if we feed him uh, average silage, fairly good silage, 30 kilos of that plus some minerals, is going to cost us <coughs> 110 pence a day or 165 pounds over the winter. A, a reduced amount of, of average silage and some concentrate instead, costing a bit more, 170 pounds over the winter. Poor silage, 20 kilos of that and 3 kilos of meal, 180 pounds or 10 kilos of poor silage and four and a half kilos of meal uh, is going to be also 180 pounds. And don't forget, uh, you'll have 850 gallons of slurry generated between now and the springtime. So in the springtime, how will we fare out? If, if we sold them today uh, in, in November, 400 kilos at two pound a kilo, um, you can argue whether I'm too high or too low there, but you, you can make the adjustment at the end. But for a nice round figure at this time of the night, two pound a kilo, 800 pounds is what is worth today. What would you feed the animal for or the, the return that you'd want to get? You can put in your own figure there. I have said 50 pound a head uh, for feeding them over the winter. They'll not all make it. 2% mortality allowance is going to cost 20 pound a head. And then from the slide before, our feeding costs in the order of 165 to 180 pounds uh, over the winter. So to, get, to meet all those assumptions, to get the 50 pound, to cover the mortality, to cover the feed, we we'll, should end up with a store at 475 kilos in the month of April, and we need to be getting somewhere between 1035 and 1050. Now, if you think you'll make 1100, very good. If he's only going to make a thousand, well, maybe you can think about the 800 in the pocket today. And don't forget half a load of slurry. I suppose there could be 10 or 15 pounds worth uh, of slurry as well. In terms of feed requirements for a 500 kilo finishing steer, again, the importance of silage analysis, uh, whether you're buying it or whether it's your own, it's important to get an idea of the, the the value of it, the feeding value. So if you've got poor silage, to make that 500 kilo steer grow at a kilo a day, you're going to need five, or five to six kilos, down to really good quality high dry matter silage, uh, down to zero or one kilos. And we have had different types of cattle in Greenmount finished at those sorts of levels, zero and one kilos. Um, and they're going to eat maybe 35 kilos of that good, really good quality silage. Now, it's important that you sell as soon as you get your target condition. Uh, as soon as they're ready for slaughter, let them go. And if the silage is poorer than you think, if you have figure in your head, well, I got analyzed last year, and I'm sure what's the point if it was something the same. If it turns out it's poorer than you think, you're going to maybe have to keep it another month or two months, and that's going to make uh, eat into your silage deficit. For a, a young store animal, a 300 kilo store steer, again, what happens if you feed no meal? Uh, if you think f feed's expensive, just feed no meal. Well, if you've got poor silage, the expected gain is going to be zero. If you've got really good high dry matter silage or, or good silage, you could be somewhere between 0.55 and 0.7, which is the, the target gain that you want to achieve over the winter. Now you'll, this one with zero gain is going to come out of the house taller, thinner, hairier a bit than he went in, and he'll really thrive at grass. Sure, you'll get the most compensation out of him, but the difficulty is that you have spent five or six months with zero gain, and you're not going to get an extra 0.7 when he goes to grass. So yes, you'll get more compensation, you'll get some of that back again, but you won't get it all and the overall lifetime performance will be hit. So in terms of animal health, I'm not going to say too much because um, uh, Maria O'Grady here will be able to answer all the difficult questions, but think about mineral deficiencies. Again, depends on, on the, the type of feed. If you're buying uh, something that you're just not uh, familiar with, there could be a mineral imbalance in it. It's important to take that into, into account Consult with your vet, take blood samples, and uh, take some professional advice. Monitor condition as well. Maybe you're thinking of restricting silage. It's important. 
uh, get physically hands-on, do a condition score of the cows or the stock, make sure they're performing, that they're, they're not getting unexpectedly thin because uh, you don't want that knock-on uh, effect on performance and fertility next year. And check the quantity and quality uh, of the feeds offered. So again, it comes back to doing that check. Am I going up the, the, the silo faster than I expected? If they're only, the cows are only supposed to be getting 26 kilos, are they getting 26 kilos? Again, a lot of uh, later cut silage, as silage cut from August onwards, there's the potential for a lot of soil contamination. So again, make sure your clostridial vaccination program is up to date. And this is definitely going to be a high, uh, a high risk fluke season. So it's important to have a, a fluke control program in place. And again, you need to consult uh, with your vet just to take into account the stage of fluke that different uh, doses uh, treat. So in summary from uh, this feeding part, call on productive stock first, get those cows PD'd, anything empty, get them away. Check your silage stocks early and regularly. Make sure that you're on track and on budget. Definitely analyze silage before you use it or before you buy it. Don't be buying that bale with 819 kilos of water. And ensure any silage replacers you buy are good value for money. So put them through the, the relative feed value calculator. And budget carefully uh, when finishing stock. So on the, the DERA website, there's links there to a couple of the calculators. This is the, the relative feed value one, where you put in your price for barley and soya, and it will give you a list uh, of straights, and you can put in your own feeds then and see whether you're buying gold to deer. And then there's another calculator, the silage and store calculator. Um, you can put in measurements for your different silos, different dry matter contents, and it'll pick out the conversion factor and give you a tonnage uh, that's available. And then underneath that, there's a number of tables with different types of stock in it. You can, a wee calendar, you can put in the day you start, the day you finish, and so on, and it'll let you know whether you're on track or not. There's some advice in that winter feeding of ruminant livestock booklet, and there's some really good advice uh, on the, the cow's website, Control of Worms Sustainably. Medium-term things, you know, that's quite short-term, all the stuff we talked about, how we manage to get through this winter. What about the longer term? We need to think about getting more from grass. And, you know, we've talked about this for a long time, uh, and yet it never seems to change, and it doesn't seem to change across other parts of the UK or the Republic. Very similar types of story. Only 18% of fields that are soil sampled, and that's important. There's two things there, 18%. And the fields that are soil sampled, there's a whole pile of fields that nobody has ever been near with a soil auger. So these are only the ones that we know about. And of the ones that we know about, only 18% are at optimum status for pH, P and K. So some remedial action needs to be taken. That means 82%, eight fields out of 10, there's some, they're underperforming. There's something that could be relatively easily and simply put right is holding back the performance. A lot of time, two, case, two cases out of three, it's going to be lime. Uh, people ask, when's the best time to spread lime? Probably about five years ago. So first, as soon as the ground dries up in the springtime, get on, with, get on with the lime, man. Get your soil sampled this winter and get, some, get spreading with lime. Use the most appropriate fertilizer. Chalk might be the cheapest. Is it the most suitable for silage? Definitely not. You need to target fertilizer towards your, the most appropriate one towards your silage ground in particular. Get your soil, your field soil sample this winter uh, before you put your fertilizer order in. Some of you might, might be too small for the ones at the back. Uh, a grazing wedge. If you don't recognize that, if it makes no sense to you, we need to do something a bit more with our grazing management. If I had a pound for every person who told me that they put the stock in the field when there's grass in it, and I take them out when they roar at the gate, we need to have a, more, uh, a better, more technical grazing plan than that. We need to be doing more grass measurement and grass budgeting. The Grass 10 project targets from the Republic we need to be doing something like this. We need to be bought into 
10 grazings a year, 10 tons of dry matter, reseeding 10%, things like that. We're, we're getting behind, I think, in our grassland management. We, we need to start catching up uh, over here. So, you know, those are things that we should be doing over the next two or three years. Longer term, I came across this quote a wee while ago. I think it's brilliant. It's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. Well, you can say that again. So what do we know? Well, probably support payments are going to be targeted differently. The system we have is, go is going to change somehow, sometime. Skilled labor is going to be more scarce, most likely. Probably more price volatility. And will we ever get back to normal weather? Who knows? But there's not an awful lot we can do about any of those things, but there are things that we can control. We need to be using all the genetic information that's available to us. There's a lot of stuff, an awful lot of animals are just bought, sight, just however they look on the day in the market with, with no indication of the genetic information behind them. Uh, we need to be, do a bit better than that and more professional. We need to use hybrid vigor and have a planned crossbreeding program. The study's gone back for years. Breed A, cross with breed B in the cow, cross with breed C, terminal sire, 23% more output of wean calf, cows more robust, more fertile, lasting longer. We should be making more use of a planned crossbreeding program. And I emphasize planned crossbreeding program, not an unsavory incident through a hole in the hedge. We, we need to be looking for moderate size, fertile, efficient cows. That never um, goes out of fashion. We, we need to be making sure that those cows can produce something that's in market spec, whatever that is. But we need to keep on top of it. There's a lot of work done and starting to be done on residual feed intake. So that if you take a, a batch of, of bulls in a pen and they're all fed the same diet and they're all growing at the same rate, there's always one that eats a kilo more dry matter per day than the average. And there's always one that eats a kilo less. It's always in, in that sort of range, plus or minus, a, a kilo at least, and a full range in between. So we need to really think about getting these low residual feed intake animals that we can get to finish more efficiently and use the least resources. And tying those, the, the labor effect and, and all the rest, easier care cows, um, we should be selecting cows and making the right breeding decisions now to end up with a long-term aim of easier care cows. You know the sort, if you've got 100 cows and you think of all the hassle that's created by the bottom 10, if you rank, rank them all in what they're worth in hassle from top to bottom, the bottom 10 cows, the worst 10, probably produce 90% of the hassle. Your 10 best cows, you don't even know you have them. What would it not be like if all 100 was like that best 10? So we need to think about uh, easier care cows. And some sort of virtual scale cooperation between producers. I've always thought about uh, having specialist replacement heifer producers and then other men who can take those and just put them to an easy calve and terminal sire and just generate as much beef as possible. That's only one example. Um, I suppose TB has always been the, the issue that makes that a bit more complicated here. So in summary, you need to do a fodder budget as soon as possible. You need to have a slightly longer term plan for soil improvement, get soil sampling this winter. We need to think about utilizing more grass and having the stock available to do that. And make sure we make breeding decisions in line with your long term goals. Okay, if there's uh, any really difficult questions, I'd be really glad if, if you could ask them, and I'd be able to pass them over on to Kieran because he gets paid twice as much as me. If there's anything nice and simple, I might be able to ask them, or else we can hand over to the next speaker. What we're going to do, Norman, is just if anybody's got, a, we want to clear the ring for to, for Francis in order to get set up. So in that, in that time period, has anybody got a question or two, for, a question for Norman? If anybody's brave enough to shout out. Is there is there a danger, Norman? I think I'm probably thinking of my own situation uh, that I'll, I'll only realise next February that, that I'm actually just short of setage and not not now. You know, we all tend to bury our heads in the sand a wee bit in this issue. 
Um, I suppose you were talking about, about soya, soya hulls as a potential way of, of stretching silage. C can you get away with just feeding soya hulls to, could, you, you could, couldn't you, could you? Um, in theory, you could meet the nutrient demand with soya hulls. The problem is, soya hulls is either dust or a very small pellet. So a, a cow or a sheep is a ruminant. It has a, a cow could have a 40 gallon stomach and it needs some sort of fiber, long fiber, to keep that stomach working. So although in theory you could meet the nutrient demand with the soya hulls, you, need, you do need some structural fiber in there to keep the stomach working, otherwise you'll have a very sick animal. And, and, and what is the minimum amount of forage you, you could get away with? You know, say, say a suckler cow eats 45 kilos fresh. Um, wh wh what's, the, what's the minimum you could get away with in that situation? <laughs> It depends how, how close to the wire you really want to go. Um, typically, we'd say to be safe, 35%, 30, 35% of our dry matter intake. You see, the trouble is you've got wet silage versus a fairly dry soil hull. So if you take everything back to the dry matter content, about 30 to 35% should be roughage. Now, if you think of a, a young, intensively fed bull, you're going down to near 10%. So the, the important thing is there, you don't make any changes overnight. If you do decide to go down more intensive, that you make all the changes gradually over at, at least 10 days, at least 10 days, and keep a very close eye on, the, on animal health. But you, you must have some long roughage in there. Keep the stomach working. And, and finally, can you comment just on the on the quality of silage that was made in the last three weeks, uh, in terms of fermentation and feed out, and, and I suppose look at the end of the day, some people just need it. Uh, let's be realistic. But yeah, yeah. The stuff that's been made in the last few weeks with a slide on it there. It's going to be very low dr dry matter because no matter how much wilting you try to do, there's not much dry at this time of the year, and the grass is going to be wet. So you're probably optimistically looking somewhere in the teens for dry matter. It's going to be very low sugar. It's going to be very low protein because it's probably been sitting there for a long, long time. So you cannot expect a good fermentation. So it's going to be quite unstable. It's, you're going to get a lot of heat at the face unless you go through it really quickly. So face management is going to be important. Use a shear grab, keep it as clean as, as possible and go back as quickly as, as you possibly can, but don't be expecting good performance because it, it's going to be low quality. Okay, um, Norman, and thank you for, for that insightful presentation. I'm going to ha hand over to Francis, to Mark, and, and to Mairead, uh, and, and to um, do our second session. Okay, is everyone able to hear me? Yeah. Okay, as uh, David said earlier, Francis Breen is my name, and um, I take, got to do with the running of the, uh, the Better Farm program, or the Better Farm Challenge and, and I on uh, a day-to-day -day basis. We've got 10 farmers involved in the program at the moment, uh, one of whom is Mark Lewis, sitting here beside me. Uh, Mark is... Um, Base just out there between here and put it down. Um, and really, what we want to do is we want to get a feel for one of the farmers that's in the program, obviously, Mark, um, what he's been doing in the past, um, what he's doing at the moment, what changes he's putting in place in his farm, and uh, where he wants to be in the future. It's very difficult to go through all the, the, um, 
financials in a situation like this without putting up um, a PowerPoint or something. And so really what we want to do is we want to use a stock um, to basically show some of the examples of maybe what he's trying to put in place in his farm to try and improve efficiency and um, ultimately improve the bottom line, uh, the profitability in the farm. So I just really want to hand over the mark uh, to give a bit, maybe to set the scene and uh, give a background to the farm. Thanks, Francis. Uh, well, the farm is about 65 hectares, 165 acres thereabouts. It was farmed by, between my father and my uncle uh, as two different enterprises. Uh, five years ago, 2012, I, I was working out. I had a reasonable off-farm income, was very comfortable in that environment, but I took a decision to come home to farm full-time. I and then realised that, hang on a minute, I have to get a living out of this. Uh, and, and that meant making some changes uh, just to try to make things a bit more efficient, a bit more manageable uh, uh, and, uh, and push numbers up uh, just to try to get the, the, the profitability where, to where it needed to be. So just in terms of land type, uh, Mark, what are, we, what are we working with there uh, and what's, you know, what, what, what's been done with the farm in the past? Uh, well, the land types, it's, it's a relatively dry farm. Uh, certainly not a wet farm, but, but uh, this year it's a wet farm. Uh, I think every farm is. The, uh, the, the land is split up. Part of the problem with the farm is that, that it's, it's, it's in two blocks, uh, about three miles apart, uh, and there's some outlying fields that, that aren't easy to graze from, from the main farmstead. Uh, and that, that leaves managing grazing and that type of thing a bit more challenging than it might be if you have your land all in one block. So in terms of the past, um, operating a spring autumn calvin block, or what, what way has calvin been in the past? And you know, uh, just when we went through a sort of a plan as to where we want to be, where, where are we hoping to get to in the future? <coughs> well, five or six years ago, we were kind of calving all year round. Uh, we, we tried to make things a bit more manageable by splitting that into one third autumn calving and two thirds uh, spring calving. And that stage, we were running around about 60 cows. Uh, today we're running around about 80 cows uh, and, and we're going to push it all into spring calving for, for next year coming on. This year we calved 20 cows in the autumn time. Uh, we've just finished with that. Uh, and we've 82 in calf to calve in the springtime. Uh, and those 20 cows will be, well, not all of them, but the younger, better cows will be allowed to slip back to the spring calving herd, taking us to around about 100 or just over 100 cows to calf down over the 12 months. Why, why move to a spring, to a spring calving system? Um, I mean, you've been doing a bull beef system under 16 months this past few years. When we went through the figures, why, why move all to spring calving? And you know, you've bought into tightening up the calving period. Why, why, Mark, just explain some of the, maybe the reasons behind that. <coughs> well, running two, two calving systems is, is, is complicated from a grazing point of view. Uh, also, I find the autumn autumn calving cows expensive to keep over the summer over the winter time. Uh, when when you're trying to keep condition on them, uh, I just find it a bit more challenging uh, from a housing point of view, uh, from a grazing point of view. Uh, management wise, just having them all calving in one block in the springtime, uh, the breeding periods all in one at, at the same time, uh, weanings at the same time with nicely even batched uh, calves coming on to finish as bulls, uh, and from a half a replacement point of view, uh, we're, we're, we've got into a position now where we're calving heifers at two years of age, uh, and once we get into a spring calving system, uh, we'll either be calving at two years of age or three years of age, and, and, and that's three years is not really an option. So, so it'll force us down that route to select our, our, our heifers that are born early in the, in, the, in the calving period and have those calving in two years' time. I suppose our past experience of farms in the programme operating the autumn calving, autumn calving is a very good system on maybe some of the more marginal areas that have maybe some good land, maybe a small area of good land, and then some rougher grazing. So that cow that's maybe calving in August, September time, calf can be weaned March, April, and uh, you have somewhere to put that dry cow during the summer. Mark's sitting with a calving at the moment, October really, September, October through to December. He's turning that cow and calf back out. Um, it's not really good use of grass and it's very, very difficult to keep the condition off that cow then during the summer too. So just in terms of the background, 
Um, our target in the program is really to try and get farms to, to up to um, a thousand euro or a thousand pounds a hectare. Um, so really, when we take output, which is our sales, less our grassland cost, our meal cost, and our veterinary, we're looking to leave a thousand pounds after that to cover the fixed cost in the farm. Mark's currently sitting at 680, which is a r just above average for um, the farmers that's been benchmarked in Northern Ireland. And we're, as I say, we're hoping to push that to over a thousand pound a hectare. Um, in terms of achieving that, we obviously have to keep more stock. We have to uh, grow more grass. Uh, Mark's already growing 10.3 tonnes of grass. So Norman talked earlier about 10 grazings growing 10 tonnes of dry matter. We've been recording grass growth on the farm this year. Mark's already doing that. It's a matter of getting the stock on the farm and utilising as much of that grass as we can and hopefully building on that then too. So just in terms of cow type, and I suppose that's why we've brought in these spring calving cows. We took a, we took a look at um, you know, what's been the performance of cows so far this year. And what we do on all farms is do a weaning percentage. So really what we're doing is we're taking a day life weight gain of calves from birth through to weaning. We're taking a look at the cow weight to see well, how efficient was is that cow. Um, you know, what was, was the cow actually weaning half of a weight? Which cows are performing best and uh, which cows ultimately aren't leaving a profit? Do you, do you want to talk maybe, Mark, through the background of these two cows, maybe... Um, maybe where you sourced them and what's been the performance of these two cows during the summer. Okay, uh, uh, the, the red cow, uh, she, she's a bought in cow, uh, at weaning she weighed uh, just short of 800 kilos, I think 795 kilos, and her calf, the red calf there, uh, uh, the, the black cow goes back uh, to when we milked a few cows on the farm, and uh, she, she was one of the, of the offsprings from the, from the milking herd. She was, uh, she's half, half Frisian, half Limousin. Uh, she's, I think, 12 year old. Uh, I, I had something in the region of eight or nine calves now. Uh, and she is 580 kilos uh, at, at weaning. Uh, those, these calves were weaned on the 17th of September, I think. Yeah, so uh, calves were actually weaned, um, well, uh, the uh, 22nd of September. So the calf and the red cow, the, the calf and the red cow, a good calf, obviously a very good calf on uh, the limousine cross region too. The, both bulls, and will be finished as bulls under 16 months. The red calf done just under a kilo a day in the cow, whereas the black calf was doing 1.3 kilos a day in the cow. So we can see the difference in milk in milking ability of uh, the two cows. How much did you pay for the red cow? The red cow cost 1,800 uh, yeah. as, a, as a spring and heifer. So both cows, of, so she was born 2013, she calved down at two years of age, 2015, and she's had a calf every year after that. So from a fertility point of view, she's doing okay on Mark's farm. The issue is we're sitting with a calf there at 240 kilos, or sorry, 200, um, and 40 kilos versus a calf of 305 kilos. To get this calf to 700 kilos, and we're really, if we're trying to get these into a carcass of 420 kilos by the 1st of June next year, the red calf has to do 1.9 kilos a day. The black calf has to do basically 1.5 kilos a day. Now, just to compare these two cows, both of these cows had bull calves two years ago. In terms of the performance of them, it actually came all the way through. Mark, do you just want to talk about what maybe yeah. the carcass yeah, gain they, or the carcass weights were out of the two cows? Yes, Francis says two years ago, they, they both had bull calves. Those calves were, were, were both slaughtered in, in July 16. Uh, and I think the, the red cow's calf was 447 kilos dead at a, at a U, U2, uh, U plus two. U plus two. Uh, yeah. And the, the black cow had a calf, I think it was 450, 455, 454 kilos. Uh, uh, it, was a, it was a U, U plus three. So, uh, so, so very little difference. I mean, practically no difference in the weight of the calves at finishing. Uh, the, the black calf, uh, the black cow's calf, incidentally, was, was killed about a month younger. It was just short of a month younger. So, so really what I was saying there is the milking ability of that cow okay, the, the red calf may look like a good quality calf and so on, but if we don't have the milk in the cow, 
the calf's obviously going to be, it's going to take an extra month for that calf to achieve the same weight. And what will probably happen this year is the red calf probably won't get to the same weight as uh, the other calf. Um, just, just in terms of the management of these, we then take a look at the, the difference in uh, the two cows. The, when we take a look at what it's taken to maintain these two cows during the winter, the red cow, 790 kilos, she's going to eat on average 10 to 15 kilos of silage a day more during the winter period than uh, the black cow. If we work that out over a six month period during the winter, you're talking a difference of somewhere between 50 and 60 pounds, okay? We take, it's going to take an extra month to take that calf to the same weight at slaughter, you're talking another 50 or 60 pounds. So there's 100 pounds in the difference of what the black cow is producing over and above what uh, the red cow is producing. Now the easy thing to say is, well hold on a second, the red cow is worth a lot more money. Of course she's worth a lot of money. But she would cost 1,800 pounds to buy. Today in the market she's probably worth, in Market Hill here, she's probably worth between 1,250 and 1,300 pounds for that type of cow. So if she's bought for 1800, she's probably depreciating by about between 80 and 100 pounds a year. What's the black cow depreciating by? She's probably appreciated maybe from whatever she calved down. Well, certainly she hasn't, she hasn't lost a lot in, an awful lot of money. So it's just, well, in terms of going through the cows, the black cow is more like what we're looking for. The red cow, well, she looks a good cow, she's not doing the job, and we're going through all the weights of the cows and calves, and we're trying to weed out these type of cows. So it's all right saying this is the type of cow that we want, Mark has a lot of the red type cows. Where are we going forward, and how are we going to adjust that cow yeah. type? Well, to be fair, she's, she's probably one of the heavier cows. Now, I think our average cow weights about 630 or 640 kilos. Uh, going forward, we, we recognise that the more limousine we get in our stock, the less milk we have. Uh, and yes, they're lovely to look at over the gate, uh, but, but we, need, we need to get calves you know, weaning at, at, at those big weights. So going forward, we have a cemental bull purchased uh, on milk figures. Uh, he's a Cleo bred bull, and uh, we're using him on, on, our, on our females that we want to keep uh, replacements from, uh, and hopefully breed a bit of milk back into the, into the herd again. And this, this is uh, a common problem across an awful lot of farms. Is, um, you know, as you move more and more away from um, the milk cross, you tend to lose more and more milk. And whilst you may have a good quality calf, you're just not getting the weight on. And if you're not getting the weight on the cow, it's taken so much more to actually achieve the end weight than after. Uh, so Mark's options really are go back to the dairy herd. That's not something that maybe you're keen on doing. It's something you'll not rule out in the future. But you want to bring in uh, another to, breed cross there. So you mean the source replacements from exactly, it? Yeah. yeah. I don't think it's something that's just an easy option uh, is finding a dairy herd that, that is freezing stock uh, and, uh, instead of Holstein stock. I, I just, uh, uh, certainly as part of the world, I think we're very Holstein oriented. So really you're going down the Samantol route in your cows. The, the only issue with this is you're not going to end up with a very big cow, you know, whenever you put Samantol back in that. Well, calving down at, at, at two year old helps, helps to reduce the, the, the end weight of the cow, I think. Uh, and managing the cow uh, is a big factor as well. Overfeeding cows, uh, letting them grow into those big animals uh, can, be a, can be a major factor. I, I have no issue with a big cow if she's performing. So in other words, if she's, if she's, she's weaning 50% of her weight, she's still costing you that extra to feed where you probably could be keeping more cows on. But I rarely come across a cow that's 800 kilos that's, rare, that's weaning a 400 kilo calf. Remember, if she's weaning a 400 kilo calf, that calf has to have done 1.75 kilos a day on the cow. There's not many calves doing than that. Now, th there may be some pedigree producers and so on out there that are saying, listen, I'm weaning it, but it's very, very difficult uh, to come across. So this year, Mark has put an Aberdeen Angus bull on his replacement heifers, and we won't rule out bringing that in as the third breed cross, huh? No, no, no. Uh, the, the, Angus, uh, the heifers that we've crossed this year are, are limousine type heifers. Uh, we've 34 in calf now to the Angus, and uh, there's no reason why they, there shouldn't be replacements to be picked from, from that cross. So these calves were weaned uh, the 22nd of September. Why weaning so early? Um, what's, what's the man, what was 
What was the weaning process and what's the management from, from now through until slaughter? Well, normally we'd wean in, in October, but the weather forced our hand a bit this year and that we housed cattle uh, in, in around the 20th, 22nd of September. So we weaned at that point in time. Uh, to be fair, that, that calf was probably one of the latest calves that was weaned. Uh, we generally would aim for, you know, for 260, 270 kilos as a minimum. Uh, I think that one was, was she 240 or 240 kilos. Uh, so uh, uh, it was just the weaning was just an abrupt process. The cows went to one yard and the, and the, the calves went to another. Uh, and yes, there was there was a couple of noisy days, all right, but uh, there was no issues. They were all they all had their double vaccines for pneumonia in place, uh, and I didn't I didn't have to inject any for pneumonia at all. And in terms of feeding, silage is tight this year, so taking the calves off the cows and we're really trying to restrict these cows now. We've yeah. done out a feeding plan of what they need and actually what they'd eat. There's a That's big right. difference there, That's Mark, in yeah, when yeah. we look at the, the quality of your silage. Yeah, those big cows, we, we reckon they'll eat about 46 kilos of silage a day if they were getting ad lib. And we're going to pull them back to, I think it's about 30 kilos. 26, 27 kilos, and then gradually building that up to ad lib. So, so we talked about a saving going from this 780, 790 kilo down to the 600 kilo cow of maybe 10 to 15 kilos of silage a day, which is 1.8 tons. But if we go from this very large cow, not restricted, down to a 600, down to a 600 kilo cow that we do restrict, rather than feeding a rad lib, there's probably another 50 or 60 pounds there as, as well. So there's a massive saving going from that larger cow, unrestricted, down to a smaller cow, that we actually do get the silage analyzed and say, what does this cow, what condition score is she in? What condition score does she need to be in a calving? And how are we going to feed her accordingly then um, over the winter period? But I suppose what I was getting at, Mark, too, is in terms of the management of these bulls, are they being pushed ad lib straight away? Or how do we want to get these through to finish? And what's your target slaughter weight? Are you able to get fat cover under 16 months of age in these? Yeah, Where well, are we the, going? The management just from weaning, they, we introduced creeps about three weeks prior to weaning. Uh, and well, we hope all, all the cows were eating creep uh, at, the, at weaning. Uh, at the point of weaning, it went on to three kilos of a 16% nut. Uh, and each month that has been increased or, or, and will continue to be increased by one kilo uh, until we get up to six or seven kilos ahead uh, at, that, at, what, at what stage the calves should be near up a year old and then they'll go pretty much ad lib then for 100 days on a lower protein, higher energy uh, meal uh, and, and, and we switch to straw as opposed to the first cut silage now and we switch them to straw then at, at that point as well. So finishing bowls, I mean, we said th th there's... There's no room um, for underperformance in, in bowls, and we can see that when we take the, the extra time it's going to take for the red calf to catch up and uh, the black calf and so on. But if, if you have calves coming in at 400 or 450 kilos, you can push them ad lib, okay, and maybe put them onto a higher energy diet and uh, we'll get them away as soon as possible. We have calves coming in here at 280, 300 kilos. You know, we have 200 days until they're going to be finished. We can't put these onto a high energy diet straight away. We want to grow free them here. So we're really trying a target of a minimum with a bull beef system under 16 months. We want them 500 kilos by the turn of the year. If they're not that, well then I'm afraid, you know, we're, we're really, they probably shouldn't be in uh, the bull beef system. So we're growing them really targeting 1.4 kilos a day. As Mark said, a 16% ration, reasonably good in energy, but not very high in starch. After Christmas, we'll reevaluate what silage is available. They'll probably go on to straw and on the meal, really, for a 100, 120 day finish. And going on past year's performance and the quality cattle we have here, we'd be, different. We, we'd be very disappointed if we weren't getting average carcass weights of in and around about the 400 kilos on the, on the, the quality calves that's, that's there. So, just maybe, Maria, if I want to bring you in at this point, you know, Mark is his cow scanned. Um, Calves were vaccinated pre-weaning. I think there's only one calf had to be jagged. Is that right, Mark? One calf has been jagged. Uh, yeah, uh, just had a uh, dirty nose at a high temperature. Yeah, so that worked. Just one issue we do have on the farms is, you know, we get cows scanned, and let's say a mark is 84 in calf there. For some reason, we don't end up with 84 calves on the ground next June. What's your top tips? I mean, you don't know Martin or uh, Mark's farming side out, but just in general, 
what's the issue, what's the main issues causing that, if you say, what's the top tips other than you've used the hard calving bull for the next winter, or based upon the summer that's been, what's, what's your tips this is autumn, you know, to make sure that we've got healthy cattle going through? Um, one of the first things, Francis, is make sure the bull's working. And I think that's something that's very often overlooked. I know you have it in all of your program farms, get the bull fertility tested. And it's not just a bull you're buying in, it's a bull on your own farm. Every season, check its fertility, because by the time you find out the bull's not working or is subfertile, you just can't compensate for that. Um, so the bull is definitely, as I say, half your herd. Second thing is, it's not infectious disease, it's none of that, it's actually energy. Um, and getting your energy requirements right. So feeding cows properly over the winter. They talk about energy. So what your cow has been fed 90 days before the breeding season impacts on your breeding season. And 90 days is a long time, and we all tend to forget what happened 90 days ago. Um, and I suppose and just on that, disease. as uh, the cows are going out there, Maria, uh, the black cows in a condition score I would put are 2.75. The red cows in a condition score, probably three and a half, maybe touching 3.75. What, what condition score should, should those cows be calving down in? 2.75 to three is kind of where you'd want them optimally. Um, a cow that calves down slightly thinner will continue to eat, perform. She'll usually clean quite well after calving. She's gonna perform and her fertility will be maximized. A cow that's fatter at calving, they're the ones that really struggle. Um, and whilst they lose weight, and to you, they look good after they've lost that weight, if you have more than one, one full body condition score change after they calve, their fertility is going to be really negatively impacted. Um, and that's before you ever look at any infectious disease. So I think a lot of time we focus on just vaccinating for the infectious diseases without looking at the bigger picture. And it's, it's, it's managing their body condition, managing their health, um, and looking at the ball, I think are probably the three key things Mark needs to look at. And other, I suppose, based on the summer that's been, fluke, what's, Mark, your fluke program is basically, you went in, would fast next, two weeks after cows were housed. What, what's, what's the other options there? Other options, so the starting point is, you know, we're looking at growth and you're looking at the level of thrive in the calves here. Um, the calves definitely need a fluke dose at housing and you want something that's gonna go down and get your immature. So as Norman referred to, not all fluke doses are going to get all the same stages. They're not all equal. So we need to be very careful of the product we pick at the certain time of the year. So get good advice. It doesn't matter what's on offer if it's the wrong product for your farm. Um, so you want something that's going to get the early stages fluke when you house them. Um, the cows at fluke dose at housing, if it's not getting the earlier stages, then you need to follow up with a second dose later on. So the likes of Fastnex, which you're given at housing, is potentially going to get all the younger stages. If there's any resistance on your farm, you're only going to know if you're testing. And to be fair, most of you guys aren't doing any fecal testing to monitor that. So it's probably quite sensible to follow up with potentially some that gets adult liver fluke, um, maybe after Christmas. Ideally, you want to turn these cows out carrying as little fluke as possible, because that's going to have a positive e effect on the amount of fluke that's floating around your farm at the end of the following summer. And Mark, what other vaccines or what other procedures have, have you in place between now and calving? Or what do, what do you normally do? <clears throat> uh, well, on the, on the breeding stock, uh, we've double bolused all the cows. Uh, we, we blood sampled those and uh, found that we had a, a low selenium problem. Uh, so so all, all the in-calf cows were, were double bolused. Uh, and uh, as far as uh, I'm done with a uh, Bovivac S, and uh, in the springtime then, prior to breeding, we'll be doing our BVD and leptose. And are you going to emit a scour vaccine uh, before calving? Well, yeah, Rotavac, uh, Rotavac and Corona vaccine uh, three to four weeks before calving, yeah. Right. Uh, so these are two in-calf heifers now into the ring. Incidentally, the red heifer is out of the red cow that just went, went out, and the black heifer is out of the black cow that just went out. So these are scanned in, in calf. Yeah. Bold when, or just what's, what, 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 was, what was the procedure with these over this, over this past year? So this year we put uh, 38, we, we selected 38 heifers for bulling uh, and decided to uh, bull them all to the Angus. Uh, and, and knowing that that would be too many for, for one Angus bull, we decided to do a synchronizing program. This was the, in the first batch, uh, we weighed all the heifers, we pulled out the 17 that were fit enough 
uh, and that was down as low as 370 kilos, uh, but, but somewhere over 400. Uh, and synchronized 17 with Cedars uh, and fixed time AI to uh, uh, an Angus bull called Americano. Uh, and, and out of that, 12, 12 held in calf to that one, and the rest were swept up with, a, with, a, with an Angus stock bull. Uh, and uh, four or five weeks later, uh, we weighed again. The heifers were a bit on the light side, but we selected 10, then another batch with synchronization, and five went in calf. Uh, but part of the lesson learned from that was they were, they were probably a little young and a little light. Uh, I think they were only up to about 380 kilos, and a range from about 350 to 380 kilos. Uh, so as, as, the, as the calving period tightens, and if we're using that sim limb cross and also bringing in some hamangus there, we're really hoping that you know, there's more heifers suitable for bowling at the beginning of uh, the breeding season because calving is too spread out at the moment. I suppose one of, one of the other issues in the farm, and we talked about the, about the weight gain of uh, the bull calves, the, the average weight gain of bull calves in the cows this year was 1.1 kilos a day, and the, which, which is really, well, it's, it's poor. Uh, we, sh we should really, on that land, be getting 1.3 kilos a day, and the heifer calves done just over a kilo a day. Um, what, what that does, doing a kilo a day on the cow, uh, the, um, the calf that we're looking to hold over as a replacement, if we're looking to get that female calf to a weight of somewhere between 380 and 400 kilos at the beginning of next June, and it's only done a kilo a day on the cow, it needs to do 0.8 of a kilo from, from now through until next June. The issue with that is, re really, we want to push those, cal those, those heifers doing about 0.6 of a kilo over the, over the winter, we're playing catch up and we probably have to push them a little bit harder than we would like yeah. to make sure that when they, when they actually go back to the grass that we're actually going to meet that weight because it's a late spring or so on, then we're not going to get them uh, to the correct weight. So it's equally as important with the heifer calf that we get as much weight in the cow or as much weight on from the cow as, as um, we, we can. And your heifer calves, what, how are they being managed at the moment? The, the heifer yeah. calves that will be bred now next year. Yeah, they're, they're getting a, a mixture of a whole crop wheat a, and a second cut silage, sorry, third cut silage, and a kilo and a half of meal. So with the silage quality, they really shouldn't need a lot of meal at, at all, but we're really trying to push them to try and get about a kilo a day from now until Christmas, so really we can pull them back then going out to grass next summer. That's so when they're a state of thrive, and uh, they're getting into that weight of 60, 65% um, of, the, of the mature cow weight whenever they've been pulled. Is, is, is there any other points you want to make on these heifers? Or, um, you know, is well, maybe, is there anyone else, has any comments, you know, uh, this is a salmon tall out of a limousine, or this is a limousine out of a limousine? This is a limousine out of a limousine. Yeah, uh, so we, we're going with a limousine out of a limousine, that's out of a limousine. You know, Norman talked earlier about getting crossbreeding in. Crossbreeding will lift your output, it'll probably help milk yield a little bit, it'll help lung longevity. If Mark keeps going down that route of, of limousine, we're just going to lose performance. We're going to get cows that are going to cost more to keep and they're going to produce less. So really we need to get some crossbreeding in, in there. Maria, is there any points you want to make just on weights of calving, getting them back in calf maybe for the third year because that can often be an issue too? Yeah, I mean, getting the cow calving down in the right condition, obviously your calf is going to be a lot more, um, get a better start. The cow calving down, I think one of the things Mark referred to, he's going to put his scour vaccinations in. He's given his, his cow or his heifer as much as he can to try and give the calf the best chance. But we do need to get that performance in our calf. And that's starting with, you know, getting your colostrum and getting your, your, your calf performing thereafter. I just find calves that are performing a little bit better, I think, Francis, you probably see it throughout the program, they're, they get less setbacks, they get less disease. A calf is just, they're a little bit more resilient. Um, if they're thriving properly. Then our vaccination programs work, our worm programs are a lot easier, and getting animals into a tight batch, you're really working hard now to get a spring calving system going here. And all of your management tasks become a lot easier because it's much more focused. The timing of your vaccinations get better, um, your, you know, your, your worm dosing strategies, we had talked earlier, Mark, about you know, dosing animals in their second season, all of that becomes a lot simpler. Um, and it's just having a plan that you can actually work to and stick to. Um, and even as you say, look, looking at your body condition score, it's so much easier when everything is at a similar stage.
to do a proper compare and contrast. Mark, your experience uh, in the past, I know you've carved heifers at two, at two and a half, and at three, you've carried some heifers maybe from the spring herd over to the autumn herd. What's been the big challenge in that? Or, I mean, you've said we're, we're going now, we really have to go at the two years of age because you're going to be all spring calving. Where's the big challenge going to come in that? And do you think it's achievable? Well, the, the big challenge in it, of course, is getting your heifers uh, fit for bulling. Uh, uh, so they'll calve there in a two-year-old. Those two heifers just away out will calve just a two-year-old. Uh, both due to calve on the 8th of February. Uh, but this one with the white stripe on her back, she calved uh, at 20, just under 24 months. And the other, uh, the other one there calved at 29 nine months. W when you're running a spring herd and an autumn herd, it's much, it's very easy to calve at, at, at two and a half because you have that option. You can select heifers from your autumn herd to, to calf down in your spring herd and vice versa. But once you go spring calving, then you don't have that option and you have to focus on getting your, your heifers fit for bowling. So again, the back breeding on these two, the dark red one is a limousine out of a Solera cow out of a Frisian. This is a limousine out of an Angus cow out of a limousine. Uh, it's the one with the stripe and I was calving down at two years of age, you said at the moment, and this one's uh, two and a half. And just visually looking at them, maybe Maria, the one that's calving down two needs that little bit extra treatment than the one that's calving down two and a half. Yeah, but I mean, you've, you've time to do that. And, and, but, I, and anybody mm. condition score changes has to be slow. Ideally, you're, you don't really want to be changing are in a position that you have to change more than a half over the common few months, but you have time to do that and it should be more than manageable. So, so, the, so the management of these cows at the moment is really, they're getting, uh, maybe you want to go through that, they get ad lib silage plus many kilos of meal? Plus two kilos of meal. Uh, these, these are batched uh, together. I, I find that if you batch a first, ti first time calves, especially the calf young, like you know, a two year old, uh, they, they will get bullied uh, and they will lose condition. Uh, if they're in big batches, especially with, with cows, so we tr we try to, uh, to to keep them on their own, or at least in smaller groups that we can monitor them a bit more closely, make sure they get their share of the feed. And that's, I mean, we've talked about feed and feed quality tonight, but one of the biggest things I find on farm is actually access to feed space. And there's no point putting the right diet in front of them unless there's adequate access. So segregating those high risk animals can certainly pay off. And uh, I suppose there's. Plenty of farmers in, in the programme with more marginal land do have uh, the autumn calvers. And I suppose one thing that is a big help in terms of trying to get those in back and calf, as well as getting the nutrition right, is separating the cow and calf. So really letting that calf suck twice a day, making sure the calf is out of sight, will bring on heats faster and you'll have a lot stronger heats. So if you're... So if you're um, doing um, some AA in those calves as well. There's no point in doing it just the day you start AA in or the day that you want to put the bull in. Make sure it's done three or four weeks in advance of that, that so that bond is sufficiently broke there uh, between the cow and the calf. And you shouldn't really get any reduction in uh, performance of the calf there either. Mark, you're really letting these cattle slip over to yeah. the spring herd, not completely slip in one. You, you, you really no, well, may calve these in January next year and then gradually <coughs> over to the spring. That's right. Normally we'd be putting the bull in now uh, to have those calving uh, for, for all of calving herd, but we're deliberately not going to do that this year. Uh, young stock like that, we, we don't want to lose out of the herd. We want to, we want to run, roll those over and we let those r run. Okay, it's going to hit the calving index a little for the next year, but we, we, we can take that in the chin. So uh, I, I'm not too sure. Um, David, I don't know if there's any questions uh, want, want to be taken here. I, I just want to get a feel across, or I suppose, what Mark's doing, where he's going, under 16-month bull beef. He is trying to maybe change the cow type that we correct that loss of milk. I think we're going to struggle to do it, even by putting the Samantal in. In fact, I think he may have to go back to the dairy herd. And we have farms that's went through in the first and second phase of the program that have went down the route of breeding their own replacements. Um, and you know, there's some of those guys have maybe maintained the milk that they had, um, and that was maybe poor, and said, well, listen, we're, we'll breed our own and we'll use some bulls here that's maybe gonna add a little bit of milk. In actual fact, when they used beef bulls that even had pluses for milk, all they'd really done was, was maintain it. And a few of those farms have went out and started to source um, 
heifers from um, the milk herd. I'm, I'm not saying you want a herd of cows to source from the milk herd, but certainly getting that injection of milk in every so often, I don't think is uh, a bad idea. We're going down the route of the Semmental and the, and the Angus. I don't think that's going to do any harm, certainly. I think it's going to be a positive, but ultimately it's, it's going to be very difficult to maintain um, the milk yield there with the way it's went in a proportion of the, of the, the cows. The other thing we're doing is we're looking to up the stocking rate. And I suppose, Mark, I want you to mention just one thing on grass this year. Wh wh where, have, where have you went to try and improve performance or improve growth or improve the utilization of grass? And where do you see that going on from forward? Well, part of the farm this year, uh, we put uh, 38 acres uh, on a, in a paddock system. And, and uh, it was the first time I'd worked a paddock system on, on, uh, before it was kind of like small fields, if you like. And, and they, they might have got a week, they might have got 10 days. Uh, we tried to shorten it this year uh, and, and work a paddock system. We measure the grass. Uh, we've tried to do it every week. And we find the system certainly helped our, our grass utilization. And uh, we grew more grass than we did before. Now, it was only in a small part of the farm. So next year, we're going to roll that out across the whole farm uh, with, with the plan of growing more grass and, and better utilization. Yeah, so we want to get a detailed soil analysis in the farm. Um, you know, there's, there's no point in growing more grass until you have the stock there to eat it and the stock there to utilize it. Cow numbers are going up. You know, you're going to have to push the thing a lot harder next year and uh, definitely utilize and probably grow a little bit more grass as well. We're sitting with a stocking rate of 1.84 cow equivalents per hectare and we're really looking to move that to 2.2 cow equivalents. Um, but ultimately, if we're doing a bull beef system, the performance of calves on the cows have to improve. Uh, and that's uh, the bottom line going forward. Is David and O, do you want to take any questions or maybe do you want to make any comments here? I, say, I suppose I just, I, I'm looking at those and, and thinking, you seem as you, Francis, are be concerned about putting the cemetery into those, into, into that big red cow is just going to end up, you know, even at Calvin, two year old and everything else, you're going to end up with a very big cow at the end of it all. I just wonder, are you going the right direction with, should you be looking at Angus, Hereford, Stabilizer, or something else that would take size out, of, potentially take some size out of those cows, you know, they are big. And, and those two heifers there, um, they're just, I suppose, I'd like to see a bit more milk in them, I suppose that'd be the other, that'd be the other issue. But um, no, no easy answers, and we're all in the same boat. Well, I suppose one, one thing we have done, David, is the, 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 bowl that, the, the bowl that has been selected is probably one of the top in the Semental breed for milk. Um, and I suppose the other thing we have to say is, when we brought in the big red cow, I mean, we're talking about a finishing system. Well, there's maybe men, his men are sitting here saying, well, listen, hold on a second, what about that cow for a weanling? You know, I'll put a good Charlie bull on her, Okay, she mightn't have the milk, but the, but the calf will still be worth, maybe I could get a calf into a thousand pound out of her, but ultimately, that, that, that heifer cost 1,800 quid. You know, the, the most probably going to realise for her is 1,300 quid. So she's depreciating, you know, she's costing, she's costing probably somewhere between 50 and 100 pounds a year or more to keep than a cow that's sitting at 650 kilos. You know, can you get a Shirley calf or can you get a terminal calf to outweigh, you know, what she's costing? I, I really don't see it, you know, in a... Now, if you're, if you're doing a steer system then, and what, and what Mark's doing, and we compare the two calves, there's obviously more time to make up the weight gain, but in a bull beef system, we have to get that calf growing really fast from the beginning. Look, the, the, the red cow was a cow for the front field. Mm. They're feeding front of the house, really. That's the best place for that cow. Impress all your neighbours. Any, anybody, any questions before we before we close it down? Like we're not gonna we're not gonna drag out the whole evening. Anybody, any comments or questions, or are you all disgusted? Go on. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a reasonable one. Well, right. to just repeat the question. Um, just what you're, Dominic, you're saying really, um, go in the route of buying semen and using AI rather than <laughs> round buying, round buying a bull.
I, I find that on our farm, AI is quite difficult for me to manage, uh, and that the farm is quite fragmented, so it's not an easy walk in with the cows. You see one on heat, we can dander into the yard and give them on a, a ring and, and, and put a straw on her. It's just not as simple as that. My, my farm tends to be quite spread out, uh, and the only way to get cows back to the yard is hook them on a trailer. Uh, so from that point of view, unless it's synchronised, AI hasn't really worked for me. Uh, and that's the reason why I went down the bull route. I suppose, Dominic, from my point of view, I think you're completely right. Um, you know, if, if, you, if you want something with reliability, for, like realistically for, for Mark, by the time he realises whether his Semmental bowl has added him more milk, it's probably going to be too late, you know, if he, if he hasn't, because he's going to have three batches of calves really coming through. Um, you know, going on the Mark's farm, I suppose, we've done the synchronisation in the, the heifers, a fragmented farm, you've got a poultry enterprise going there as well. It was going to be more difficult to get AA this year. It's something you wouldn't rule out in the future if we got another batch maybe going around the house. But I think we've done fairly well this year, maybe just basically getting that ball in, getting the Angus and the heifers, and getting the AA started off from that point of view. If we see a big improvement maybe in Cavanese or in the quality of calves out of this Angus bull, I mean, you're open to roll nothing out, Mark. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Okay, folks, look, uh, I think uh, a big thank you to Mark and, and for bringing in his stock and for being so eloquent and, and, and whatnot this evening as well. And certainly not everybody would want to do what Mark has done, so big thanks to Mark. Um, <laughs> I, I'm just going to hand over to, to, to Liam McCarthy from EVP, who's just going to summarise very quickly. And also, there's a draw, there's a draw for beef, so don't, don't leave without... If you win, don't leave without it. Please don't leave without it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's good to see so many people here for this meeting. We had a very successful one in, in, in Balamina and hopefully a very successful one in Oma uh, on Thursday night. Um, ABP has been involved with the Better Farm program and now the Better Farm Beef Challenge since 2010. We have had some magnificent results and I see some of the men who benefited most here tonight. One of them said to me a few months ago, if he got anything out of the Better Farm program, it was to be smarter rather than work harder, to work smarter. This is a great partnership for ABP, along with the Farmer's Journal, CAFRI and CAFRI. Everyone seems to work exceptionally well and we seem to get great results. At the present minute, we have probably one of the highest beef prices, if not the highest beef price in, in Northern Ireland. So really, at the minute, it's up to, see, up to you to see if we can improve margins within the, within the farm gate. Can I finish by thanking all the speakers, thanking you for coming, and hopefully one of you will walk away with a Christmas hamper of beef and lamb. So could we just have the draw tonight, please? Maria, could you Mark, possibly pull oh, one no, out no, there? No, Maria, Maria you, you did. Aye, perfect. Did you, have you, did you enter it? Um, I have 273 here. Anybody got 273? I suppose there could be 273 in the other room as well, but I have 273. I'll lift another one, Maria, just in case, but 273 is the winner on this. I've got a reserve of 487, but 273 is going to get it first if they... 273 there, first. please. If we got your name, we can have it delivered to you, okay. hopefully before Christmas. Folks, uh, 273. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll find them before they go, hopefully. I've got a 487 reserve. So, look, uh, um, just in closing, can I, can I thank Maria as well, Francis, Norman, Kieran, but especially um, thank you all for coming. It really is much appreciated that you took the time out this evening to, to be here. So, thank you.